Good morning or afternoon, folks, wherever you may happen to be, and whether you're watching live or archived, welcome to our Tech Talk Tuesday, where we're doing a little bit of webinar stuff. We're doing it as roundtable format. We're going to be involving a bunch of everybody, and uh, today we're talking about transmitter site travels. Not so much the getting to the site, although that's certainly going to be some more stories featured in that, and uh, but uh, more like the what do you got to have in your toolkit? What do you got to have in your truck? How do you pack all this stuff? Things like that. I'm going to try for a lot of interaction, so just be in mind we will be calling on you to uh, provide your thoughts and input. I've got uh, two great guests with me today. Uh, Rich Parker is the Director of Engineering for Coast Alaska. Before that, Rich was with uh, Vermont Public Radio, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct, Rich? That is true. Excellent. And we've also got Alex Hartman, mad scientist, genius, inventor extraordinaire, who's uh, done contract engineering, still does, worked with University Radio, and is also a Nautel customer service support tech. So, Alex, welcome. Hello. Now, before we get too far into this, I do have a few housekeeping things to discuss. So, we've uh, got a questions panel on your control. Anybody who's been to one of our webinars before will be familiar with this. If you haven't, by all means, you can type questions. As we go along, because we do want to be interactive with this, there is a hand raise icon that you can click. Raise your hand and uh, I'll be keeping an eye out for that. We'll try to address you. Uh, if you've got a microphone, then you do that, then we can unmute you and, uh, and make you part of, the, part of the presentation. It'll be a lot more fun that way. Um, like I say, we wanna keep this as interactive as we can, do it sort of round table style. It's kind of a, a different way of approaching a webinar, so uh, we'll see where it goes. All right, um, also, if you are an SBE member, Following a Nautel webinar is a half a credit under category I. I think that's an I, not an L. With that font, I can never be sure. Uh, I see Wayne Pacina's in the audience, so uh, we can always uh, get Wayne to correct me at some point and let me know. Uh, but uh, definitely, it does give you half of a research credit. So, as I said, the uh, the goal is we're going to have a little talk amongst the, the panelists to get you an idea where we're headed with this. And then we basically want folks to jump in. We'll hit a point and say, hey, what do you guys do for this? Um, I'm going to just throw one out here real quick, give you something to think about for the next couple of slides while we get rolling here. But if you could, in the question box, pick the one thing that you absolutely don't leave home without when it comes to site visits, site maintenance. I mean, for me, for example, it's a pocket knife. So what's the one thing that you need to have in your toolbox? Throw it in the questions uh, section on the chat screen and uh, we'll run through them in a couple of seconds. Okay, uh, as I said, we can do the, uh, the um, round table with microphones as well. So raise your hand if you think you've got a, a comment. I'm uh, seeing a couple of things coming in in the questions now, so thank you very much, folks. Oh, there's a greenie. Thanks, Tony. I appreciate that one. Uh, everybody's probably got an XLI greenie somewhere. So looking at sites, I uh, grabbed a couple of pictures. I would, I'd like to say at random, but they're not. Uh, the first two are Rich's translator in, uh, that's Ketchikan, right, Rich? Uh, that's uh, actually that one's a, a, a full service uh, two FMs on top of Ock Mountain, uh, just north uh -huh. of Juneau. And the only way to get to that one's helicopter a good chunk of the year. Do you have drive-in access at all through the year? No, that, that you could hike if you wanted. There's about a three and a half mile trail to a, a cabin, and then you'd have to kind of slog through a, a what they call a muskeg, what we call a swamp or a muskeg, to get to it. So it's not really advised to try to hike to it. You right. can climb up the, the front if you're quite the mountain man, which is how they did the electrical service. But yeah, it's not recommended. Hiking down is a lot easier though. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the funny thing about, uh, especially as you get older, gravity works better. So uh, down is good, up is uh, not so good. Um, yeah. By the way, uh, John Antonuk sends you greetings from Fairbanks. Oh, hey, John. Good to see you. So, or hear you. so, um, <laughs> <laughs> so Alex, this other one, uh, this is yeah. uh, your site, KVSC. Yes, it is. In all its mud puddle glory. And if I'm not mistaken, that one was taken about the time you were about to take delivery on a new transmitter. Yeah, that was uh, late March-ish. 
So yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, late March. So this uh, goes into the same thing. Like, how do you prepare the site to take new gear? You know, when you walk up, uh, drive up to the site that had a nice clean road last time you were there, and you see something like this, it's like we're not getting in here with a straight truck. Yeah, so, box truck did not make his way back there that day. So kind mm. of the thinking about the various types of planning. All right, uh, now Rich, uh, I, I know I, I've got the uh, the Bach Mountain site, the one of your arguably, I think your least accessible. Although I could be wrong there, you've got some other ones that are a healthy drive or ferry ride or, or plane trip, aren't don't you? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm fortunate in that the majority of our sites um, are not quite this remote. We have one other one that's on um, a mountain outside of Petersburg, and it's also a helicopter trip up. Uh, the rest of them, you can walk kind of a drive to, but the problem is that in Southeast Alaska, it's kind of like a string of islands in a way, although it's got Canada up against it, so we're, we're snuggled up against the ice field. But to get to every site, I have to fly, uh, usually, or um, you can take a ferry, but the ferry hasn't been running in such a long time that it, it's kind of hard. Uh, but in any case, once you get there, you're there, and um, it's uh, it's not impossible to get things. But it would you'd have to wait for like another flight or something if you missed if you forgot something really important. So that's never a good thing. And that's kind of the 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 goal of this is to get the the ideas from folks like the the must haves and uh, like Steve Nepreth, uh from Will Will Wilmar Wilmot uh, Northern Minnesota Minnesota. But Steve yeah. mentions uh, never go to a site without the laptop. Um, Duncan says a good flashlight. Now that that's yeah. huge. I mean, because and and if you're doing any work, what's the first thing you're going to do? You're going to drop something. And where's it going to go? <laughs> Underneath something. <laughs> Murphy know, will have his way every that's time. That's right. And what's Murphy's law? If it falls to the least accessible spot. Yeah, it somebody. will find the lowest spot possible. Or, or the one that'll cause the most damage if you forget to get the part out. Correct. Oh, well, there's that, yes. <laughs> oh, I'm, Brian I'm surprised. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm surprised uh, all the comments that came up like nowadays, especially some of the places like the one you're showing there, is a extra cell phone charger. Yeah. yeah. Yep. That's also a really good one. Um, and more and more Battery USB. Banks. USB is critical, yeah. Um, yeah. Brian Gullickson made a good point, especially for folks on shared sites. And, and I know he's got uh, at least one or two uh, bolt cutters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. How many times have you had the daisy chain of locks bypassed by somebody that didn't know how it worked? Yep, many. Uh, I've had a couple of those uh, uh, three letter uh, named tower companies where the last guy in was the new guy and like oh look why did you put your lock around four others or you know put it around the wrong bolt mm -hmm. yeah. um tony dimsdale's got another good uh, point he, he mentioned the greenie earlier and uh, a camera it's uh and, and this is something especially w with cell phones these days i mean it's so cool because you can take a picture of something send it to the manufacturer rep while you're on the phone Yep. Or you can live stream it, Facebook live it, whatever. And I, I've had customers put me on the phone and run Facebook live so they could show me exactly what they were seeing. If you're lucky enough to have the kind of bandwidth, Rich may not have that luxury in certain parts of the state where he's at. But yeah, absolutely. The yeah. best thing ever was uh, the phone that has a really nice camera. But uh, if you can expense it, the one that also comes with a pen. Uh, so you can take a picture of what you're doing and draw notes on it for later and then use something like Google Google Cloud Sync. You know, all these Android phones and iOS phones require an account. They all go right into the cloud as soon as they have service again. Right. So that way you've always got a historical log of what you've done. So, yes, yeah, phone is absolutely indispensable. I might have many. I think I have several thousand pictures on the cloud of sites, readings, um, things I take apart. That was the greatest thing about phones is if you ever take something apart is take pictures of it as you're taking it apart. And Indeed. I mean, the know. phone is probably one of the most indispensable because of uh, 
the number of things that it is capable of doing in a very, very small lightweight footprint. When I go to a transmitter site, uh, all of my customer sites, for instance, we keep Google Docs, uh, uh, Excel spreadsheets of meter reading. So we're doing them right there in real time. So we have a historic record. Then again, if they don't have service, it goes right up there once they do have service. And, you know, oh, what was the, what was the plate volts on this? Or, uh, hey, what was the, the tower light reading on this? What was your voltage on this leg of this thing? Well, you have that because you put it in the phone sitting right in front of it. You don't have to remember, oh, which notebook did I put it in? Oh, crap, I left it on the airplane seat. You didn't lose anything. It's all right in front of you. Um, and pictures, like I said, you get the one that you can draw on or even the ones that don't have the pen, you can use your finger to draw on. Take notes of what you're doing so you have historic record. You know, oh, I changed the transmitter taps. Well, where was it from where to where? You know? So those types of things are very, very useful. Just the ability of logging in your pocket, whereas everybody's had the three ring binder and mice have gotten a hold of it or, you know, things like that. Those are, that is probably one of the most indispensable tools. However, it does rely on a battery and mine, for instance, gets me about a day of regular use. If I'm actually out on site, I will need a charge probably midday. And that's where that battery bank comes back into play. So, so those two things are th those two things with my eight way screwdriver are the three things that I absolutely have to have in my pocket. Mm -hmm. And I mean, uh, I see that uh, Paul Black made a comment about uh, always have a multi tool, which uh, goes along the same lines as the eight way. I mean, that way you've right. got a knife, pliers, screwdriver, depending on the specific whether you're a Leatherman or a Gerber type fan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Gerber. There you go. There you go. Um, and uh, Duncan mentions uh, propane or map gas torch for thawing frozen locks and latches. Uh, for those oh, of yeah. us that, uh, that see the snow and the ice, there's nothing worse than getting up to the site, trying to jam the key in the lock and nothing happens. Yep. And that's situational too. I'm sure it happens a lot more for Rich being in a, in a part where the frost never goes away. But here in Minnesota, yeah, the wintertime, my toolkit changes um, versus summertime. I, the map gas, yeah, probably will go into the truck. Uh, for your, you know, every time I go out, you don't leave it in the truck, obviously. Uh, but the, uh, you know, the times where I need it for a frozen lock versus brazing a ground system is two different scenarios. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, one other thing. <laughs> okay, Tony adds or hairspray and lighter if you're driving the wife's car. Um, <laughs> That's good. Uh, you know how rare Aquanet that. is nowadays? I mean, you, you just can't find it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, somebody else, uh, Jeff Wilson, with us mentions that he calls the uh, phone his outboard memory. Now, I'm a little old fashioned. I use the phone for a lot of stuff. I put notes in it, I take pictures and everything, but I still rely on one of these. Yep. And, I mean, this thing, you know, having graph paper in it, especially, I, I call it. Uh, I call it um, manual, manual um, iPad type thing. It's uh, non-volatile memory. But uh, whatever you use, uh, Steve had asked if there's a good uh, alternative to manual logbooks at sites, like a, a cloud-based app, so you can pull up logs and notes. Um, there's uh, anybody's got a comment on that? I'd uh, I'd definitely like to see a hand. And, and Steve, if you've got a uh, if you've got a mic with you, then uh, raise your hand and let me know, and we'll uh, we'll throw you on there, and you can uh, expand on that a little bit. How I'm clicking, he's probably in here. Go, I don't want to be on the. Yeah, let's see. There. Like okay. I said, I did use Google Docs for that because usually every transmitter site, I give it a, a, a Gmail account essentially, so I have an email address that I can plug into the transmitter and something that associates with that site. Oh, cool. um, you know, whether it be call sign or whatever, you know, client name slash call sign as one Gmail account. So that mm -hmm. way I've, their, their logs are for that account are there because it's all in the, the Google Docs. You know, they get the free gig of storage or whatever. So if you have like a, a, a handful of pictures at the site that goes up there, you, you know, all your readings, pictures, everything about that is right there at, for that one specific site. So it's all in one place. You don't have to try and go hunting for it. Now, right. one of the things that I do a lot, and uh, I, I've been beating the drum on it recently, is Evernote because it's um, mm -hmm. it, it's cloud-based, it's storable, and it's got some uh, text recognition to it. So I can yep. 
if I work really hard at neatly printing my notes, then I can just grab a, a screenshot with the phone and, and save direct to Evernote. Yep. That's good. Yeah. Yep. Okay, and uh, here's another one from Joe. They used to take uh, screenshots of the, well, in, in his case, the, the AUI, the Nautel web page, and save them, but uh, anything that's got a, a graphic user interface, grab grab screenshots and uh, save them for, for meter readings and logs. That's a good idea. Absolutely. So oh. to, Alex was talking about uh, those things. We settled on something uh, which I'd never used before. It's called... Um, Smartsheet, hmm. and it integrates uh, into Outlook and different things like that. We have an Outlook 365 account for Coast Alaska. So uh, the thing that I really like about that is it's very similar to what Alex was saying in that you, um, I use it, which I never thought, you know, when I first started this business I'd need, but I have uh, every site's got uh, like a page. Well, every station has pages of IP numbers as well and what the devices are and what the, the MAC addresses are and, and all that. And that can be accessed through the cloud. Um, there's a few sites, Alex, that we have difficulty getting um, a cell service, but by the nature of things here in Alaska, almost all of them are co-located, not either directly or close to a cell site. So it's mm -hmm. usually pretty easy to get some kind of connectivity, although and some of our translators out in the in the islands, that's uh, that can be really challenging. At times. Yeah, I know uh, the the mountains of Montana. Even cell companies don't tread there half the time. So, right. you know, getting getting broadband access, you know, outside of town in Montana, or uh, the uh, even up on the mountains in Idaho, can be a little bit of a challenge. Um, you know, so there is, like you said, outboard memory. So, you know you do your logging on that device and then when you do have signal it automatically goes there and it's automatically logged and it's uh, self-fulfilling documentation like you said ip addresses for the sites you know you, you could go in and create a google spreadsheet of here's where those ip addresses are you know you know, far be it for me to recommend a password list i use keypass uh, on my phone uh, for those sites so you know, if I have a password or a, a combination lock uh, code or whatever else for a communal site, uh, all that's stored in my phone as well. Because I, everybody who is an engineer, we all know, just like me, this thing is no more than five feet from me at any given point. Right. <laughs> you know, I my wife hates the fact that I sleep with this more than her sometimes. But... <laughs> It's yeah. what's that noise? What's that noise? That's right, exactly. Why, why did it go ding? I'm like, oh, six in a row. I know what that means. Yeah, uh, <laughs> you know, um, you know, things like that. Uh, we've kind of conditioned ourselves to be part of that world. Uh, as far as other tools, though, I mean, you know, Rich has the challenge of, you know, being he's limited to his uh, ability. You know, he like he was mentioning when we were setting this all up, he has to be able to fit it into three 50 pound suitcases to get anywhere he needs to go. Uh, you can't really put a acetylene torch in a 50 pound case and ship it to where you need it to go. Uh, you know, things, things that the luxury of having a vehicle available uh, is completely different in, in, in rich or even some of, uh, you know, the lower 48 areas too. Um, you know, you get out into like the Tucson area out in the mountains, you know, yeah, you could drive there, you know, take a, take a track mobile up there or, you know, the mountains of Montana or even the swamps down in Louisiana. You know where you got to take an airboat. Um, right. I've done that. <laughs> you know, they're like, hey, "What's your transportation?" That, and you're like, uh, "It's a V8 strapped to a fan." Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> or it's got an aluminum sheet underneath it to keep you out of the water. Right, and that's about it. So <laughs> you know, you got to be able to you know be very selective where you can't you know. My truck has a bunch of tools in it, you know, including garage wood. Who has the chunk of four by four in the back of there that you need to prop something up with? Well, yep. that's a luxury for a lot of guys like you. you well, know. and we'll, uh, we'll we'll get into that in a second too, in a little more detail. Um, let's see. So Ed, who is our uh, the organizer and the guy that uh, puts all this together, and actually almost makes me look intelligent some days. And I'm not sure how he works that miracle, but that's beside the point. Um, However, Ed did have a question for Rich, and so I'm going to uh, I'm, I'm going to let Ed open his mic up and uh, ask his question directly. Yeah, thanks, uh, guys. Thanks for doing this. It's really uh, really informative. Rich, I'm just wondering, 
some of those remote uh, transletter sites of yours, do you ever put any consideration to uh, large brown critters that you might encounter? And are there uh, any contingencies for that kind of thing? Uh, well, we, yeah, and you know, it's a kind of a double-edged sword because um, in the small planes and certainly in the aircraft, you can't you can't bring uh, bear spray. Um, <clears throat> some of the smaller planes, like the float planes and things, they'll let you put them inside the skid. Um, and um, I haven't really had much um, encounters with bears. The one closest encounter we had was um, in uh, Yakutat, and that was just we were working on a site, and we decided to go for a walk one day on a on a well-known trail. And uh, I was with the station manager, and we walked up the trail. It's about a three-quarter mile trail, and about halfway up, we saw a brown bear cub, and we're like, uh oh. So we just kind of quietly turned around and went back because where there's a brown bear cub, there's a mama, and they are particularly difficult when they have uh, children around, so you want to slip away. Uh, it's tough. Some people carry weapons. Like you can't really carry a weapon on the plane easily. Um, I talked to a, a guy in up in Unalaska, Dutch Harbor, who was a, a field engineer uh, for a bunch of sites. Uh, I mean, you know, like a, a, um, a surveyor engineer kind of type guy. And um, he turned me on to something that I thought was just quite remarkable. He said he's tried carrying, you know, weapons, bear spray and all that kind of stuff. And he turns out that it's heavy. It's uncomfortable. It's hard to get on the plane. And he found out that he can carry those, uh, you know, air horns, canister air horns. And he said those are really quite good at deterring a bear. I mean, it's not, it's not perfect, but I mean, it's it it it's enough of a kind of a it's like an audio flashbang, and they don't like it. So uh, I've been pretty fortunate to not have uh, any any real close bear encounter sites. Uh, the funniest story about that is when I went up to the to the really high mountain outside of Petersburg, Lindbergh Peak. Um, the pilot took us up there, and you can see how small those pads are. Uh, but uh, he flew around the top of the site, and I said, "What are you doing?" He goes, "Oh, uh, bear check." <laughs> so, you know, the helicopter flies around the top of the mountain site and makes sure there's no bears nearby, and then he lands because you don't have a lot of room once you get out of that helicopter. You know, Great, the, the, you. the air horn actually makes a lot of sense for multiple reasons, not only for critter control, but also if you're in trouble. How do you, yeah, you, you don't have, you got a dead battery in your phone, your battery, you know, all else is out of there. What do you do to tell someone you need help? I kind of right. like that. That's that, that's a very yeah. easy, cheap piece of insurance right there. It is. And you usually don't get in much trouble carrying them on a on a flight. You know, right. It depends on, you know. They just think you're a soccer yeah. fan. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Now, one other thing that uh, Steve Schoon had mentioned, and it's really easy to overlook, um, not related to tools and test gear, but uh, make sure you bring some water along because it's real easy to get stuck at a transmitter site for 8, 10, 12 hours and uh, have absolutely nothing to drink. And that can make for a really, really uncomfortable day. Yeah, yeah. That's true. What I try to do with all my sites that are a little bit more off the beaten path, I've got a couple that are on mountain tops here in Minnesota. Um, you know, we can, they're very large hills. So I wouldn't call them mountains by any stretch of the imagination. There's a couple sheer cliffs, but there's only one mountain in Minnesota that actually qualifies as a mountain. Uh, but in those inaccessible sites where you know it's, you know, you, you, you got a two hour hike up the side of the hill, you know, with a pack or a sled behind you or something like that. What I typically do is if there's a, a means or a method for a vehicle to get up there at any point, whether it be like a snowcat or, uh, you know, whatever, anything to get up there, you, you, I'll throw the guy 50 bucks or 100 bucks and say, hey, I'm going to run to the store real quick and I'm going to throw a case of water in there and everything else. Uh, you know, the, right. the, the unpleasantries, as we call them, you know, yeah. a rubber made case of toilet paper, shop rags, the five gallon bucket, everything you need. Yeah, right. and some water to to leave at that site. I think that's a key thing, Alex, is uh, as much as you can, I mean, this goes for supplies, tools, small uh, or heavy tools, is I also have pictures of of all of my sites, like what tools are there, and I haven't gotten quite as organized as writing it all down, but uh, the more things that you can have at a site or leave at a site, like if you can afford to go to a site, take tools, and then leave some there, and then come back and replace those, it makes things a lot better you know going forward mm -hmm. uh, well like i, I said sure 
with my right. contract guys, with my contract guys, I tell them that the first visit, if I don't see these specific tools, you're getting them and they're going to stay there. And that's going to be part of your bill, just the way it is. If you're going to ask me to fix a harmonic filter that's 12 feet in the air and you don't have a ladder, that's you're problem. getting a ladder. <laughs> And a, yeah. and a 12 foot ladder is not something that you're easily going to throw in the back of a passenger van. Right. No, exactly. You know, no, find so a 10 foot a, step ladder. Here's a good question from, uh, from Don Eastman down in Kentucky. Um, they have station vans that are, that are used by many. So it's not just a dedicated engineering van and uh, a lot of toolboxes can get pretty heavy. So what's, and Rich, this would be a good question for you because you load in and load out almost every time you visit a site. So how do you pack tools and equipment so you can load it and unload it easily? Uh, what I finally, after a couple of years, what I ended up doing is buying one of those um, those rolling toolkits. <clears throat> you know, they make them, uh, what I happened to got was from um, uh, Home Depot. They make uh, every every company's got one. I went for the <clears throat> the most the lightest, but the most durable. And uh, it's a it's a three part box. Is the best I can explain it. That it's like on a rack, like a it looks like a, a I don't know, like a, a, a furniture dolly kind of you know black rack. You pull it down like your luggage. So there's a big box at the bottom, then there's a medium sized box, and then there's a small box on the top. So what I could do is I can I can sort that so that the bottom box, which has got the wheels and the handle, I fill that up till it's 50 pounds with some of the larger uh, stuff that I need. Then the second box uh, the same way, and then the top one is typically a lot of smaller things, small tools, connectors, that kind of stuff. And then for my purposes, what I can do is I can take the the lower boxes, 50 pounds. I take the top two boxes and I strap them together. Those are 50 pounds. Those come apart. And so then at the airport that I can check those and then I can have a third box, um, which is typically my, because uh, I'll be gone in most cases, unless it's just the one here, I'll be gone for at least a week. And so that'll be like, I'll have my suitcase, which I'll have some clothes. I put some snacks, food, and things like that, and then um, I fill that up the rest with the 50 pounds with other uh, equipment, test equipment, or uh, tools and things like that. And then, of course, you have carry-on, so I can carry my laptop and uh, and, a, and another carry-on bag. And that typically sometimes gets heavy, but it's it's easy because it's a rolling rack. So I, I really I used to take just think you know uh, different flight cases and. Uh, Pelican cases and all that, and I realized like this is just nuts because I was hauling these things around through airports and all that. And the the rolling thing was kind of a big revelation to me. Like, oh yeah, let's just do that. <laughs> uh, Marco Rito is saying that uh, the Milwaukee packout toolboxes uh, from Home right. Depot. So that sounds like what you're describing. Yep. Yeah, I mean, mine's not that that high Dewalt end. I got Husky, I just got the house brand. But... Yeah. What's that? Dewalt Husky Milwaukee Makita. They, they all, all have them. that. Yep. Yeah, cool. and, and I just went by. I think Husky is the lightest of the size, the lightest for the right size. Yeah, um, I have. Since I don't, I have to only worry about getting the, those are typically in and off of planes or on a helicopter, so it's not like I'm shipping them. So I don't need like the, the super heavy duty. I've I've always got to kind of, uh, I have a big postal scale in my shop. <laughs> so <laughs> just give you an idea because um. You don't want to show up at the airport and have to pay seventy-five dollars for that one extra screwdriver that you put in that made it fifty-one pounds instead of fifty. Right. Pounds. Yeah, and that does million. vary too, depending on whether you drive yourself or whether you take a flight. Uh, Tony Dimstel right. made a, a good point that Jensen makes uh, nice rollout uh, tool cases. They're that uh, basically tool cases that roll like luggage. So. Right. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah. I, I know Pelican and uh, oh the SKB. other. Yeah, yep. yeah, there are a yep. lot of them. So those that's mm -hmm. a really good idea. Um, the other thing I like Rich's suggestion, not so much for the airport, the, the 50 pound limit, but uh, most companies have a, a personal lift limit of some sort. So you size the tool case so it won't hold more than 75 to 100 pounds of stuff. Right. So, uh, so yeah, that uh, that's one good way of doing it. Uh, I like uh, Rubbermaid bins for the lighter weight stuff, documentation, things. Well, documentation is yep. not lightweight, but stuff like that. 
Right. I mean, the, the, the Rubbermaid idea is more for things that you leave at the site to, to keep critters out of the documentation right. you leave on site or your yeah. toilet paper or your shop rags, you know, uh, keep it from getting wet or floating away in certain instances. Um, if you're in the floodplain mm -hmm. areas, you know, the, the savable items, you know, you, those are what those things are really, as you can tell, I, I, I do like my Rubbermaid totes for organizing things. So yeah. those are the kinds of things that I really, uh, prefer myself too so that way it's at a glance i can say oh that's what that is yeah um, you know so for organizational but the uh the 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 toolkits are and i wanted to ask you rich knowing and a lot of guys i know uh, in the field who you know you can pry my de uh, tectronics for my cold dead hands the oldest tube based oscilloscopes where they weigh 50 pounds by themselves and yeah, it's, it's a luxury to carry around, but it's the tool they've had for 30, 40 years, whereas you don't get that luxury. Have you found newer test equipment that has become more compelling for you to move towards because of those size limitations, like oscilloscopes, well, spectrum analyzers, such like that? I, you know, I, I wish that I could say we had the budget to get things like a field fox or a small analyzer. The, there's some really good things out there, but... I was fortunate in that um, when I got here, there'd been some previous uh, flush times. And uh, so I've got a couple of 2711D uh, spectrum analyzers, the uh, Andrew 2s, and, and that, that works really well. And um, it's the kind that has a tracking generator. So what I've been able to do is make a poor man's um, analyzer out of it. So okay. I take a, a 20 dB splitter, uh, combiner splitter, little, it's like a little box, I don't have it with me, and then I, run it through both ends and calibrate it. And then I can use that for checking uh, reflections on antennas, checking, you know, tuning and all that kind of stuff. So it's a kind of a cheap poor man's way to do some basic, uh, basic stuff. Um, you know, it's not perfect, but I found one site where the, the antenna was, uh, the station was 10, I want to say 1071. The translator it had been installed really quickly. It was an issue where there's, the ferry was coming. They had to get the heck out of there. They had been doing a bunch of sites, and the antenna turned out was like 90.9, and they couldn't figure out why they couldn't get the visor down. So hmm. they were able to see that uh, hmm. that mismatch, and you know, so it's. I would say that's my number one high tech tool. The other is the. Um, oh gosh, I'm having a brain freeze. But the little black, uh, they're little audio uh, meters. They're just a. Um, receive only audio meters and then some kind of a little generator. Sometimes I use a little tiny uh, audio generator. I mean, there's tools that do it a lot better mm -hmm. that are smaller, but um, we're kind of also some budget constraints here. So it, it's always a challenge. Sure. Jeff, you're muted. Oh. I like it better that way. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what, what you're looking at here, for example, is the winter toolbox that goes in the back of my truck. Yeah. And I, I mean, not toolbox. It's just how do you how do you get your uh, get your truck around? Um, Tony says that uh, one of the things said Copper Mountain VNA Signal Hound Spectrum with tracking generator. Oh, nice. Yeah. So a little portable, and uh, as I recall, those things are, are fairly budget sensitive too. So for mm -hmm. for the folks which is these days most of us who run with an eye on the bottom line uh, that that's the kind of thing that's useful yeah. uh, more and more and especially it like, used to be an oscilloscope you had to have an oscilloscope but if you're working fm these days that doesn't come into play an awful lot no uh, i mean i could count on one hand the number of times i use the scope spectrum analyzer yeah all the time all the time yep the scope I use all the time for AMs specifically, more than I do anything else. Right. Uh, but the scope, I'm finding myself using more and more in the digital realm, uh, you know, tracking uh, status IOs off of remote controls that are not functioning properly. You know, it's like mm. so things that you can't get out, of, like in an open collector system where it's like, oh, is it closed or I don't know, transistors holding it, you know. So mm -hmm. I'm finding myself using a, a digital scope more and more to do more of the data logging than I am anything else. Right. And I say or something like noise that. And stuff. Right. And if you're in a situation like I am where you drive to, I mean, in my infinite spare time, I assist with the uh, with the maintenance on a little community station here. And uh, a tow strap is really, really useful on our particular site road. Mm -hmm. 
you know. Yeah, <laughs> if, that's true. if you're not dragging somebody else out, you're getting drug out yourself. Someone better have a pair. Same with jumper cables. I right, like that right. uh, picture of Alex's site. It reminds me of a lot of the roads in Vermont that they call mud season. They all looked like that. Yep. And, uh, yeah, early spring. First moved there, they, all yeah. of them look like around here. When they when I first moved there, they told me that the best thing you can do is stay in the middle of the road. Because then if you get stuck, somebody has to help you because nobody else can get by. That's what they told me. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was pretty funny. That is key. That is key. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah, the planning the planning things of, you know, knowing your territories and you know, you don't, you be ready for anything kind of thing, I think is really the depending on where you are or where you're going. Uh, I'm a Midwest guy and I went down to uh Kentucky the first part of this year. Yeah, I didn't know what to expect. I hadn't gone through there to go for work or anything ever. So I didn't know what I was in for uh, when I got on site. So, you know, it's like, okay, I did. A, I bring my winter jacket. I brought, you know, the, the, the hoodie and things like that. You know, extra boots. Is it going to be muddy? Is it what kind of terrain am I going to deal with? I know they've got bluff country down there. You know, those kinds of things. What am I in for? Um, one of the things that I always throw into my uh, winter pack is extra socks. Oh yeah, That's the worst point. thing in the world is a cold foot. Yep, absolutely. And I mean, extra socks are useful all year round, just because mm-hmm. you get yeah, you step in a puddle, you walk outside, you next thing you know, your foot's wet. And I mean, the other thing, keep them in a Ziploc bag. Yep, 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 yep. I even bring. Um, I know it sounds crazy, but I, I bring a pair of those indoor outdoor uh, slippers. Mm-hmm. What I could do is I'll take my boots off and let them kind of air out. And then yep. I put these indoor outdoor slippers on. I go around the, the thing. I mean, you want to be careful because they're not no toe protection. If you're doing something heavy, you don't want to do that. But um, right. yeah, keep yourself dry. I always throw in the extra <clears throat> undergarment layers. Um, mm-hmm. Look at a Jeff's bag here. I um, I also I didn't mention this before, but a lot of times when I leave out, I'll also have a basically a go bag, which is some water, some Extra clothes, dry clothes, uh, and some, uh, especially in the wintertime, some uh, hiking sticks and uh, the big boots. Because, um, and at one site, the, we've been uh, keeping at least a pair of snowshoes up there. Uh, sure. Because one time we did have to walk down, and it's not pleasant if you're not, you know, you're not prepared. A couple of the sites are, are set up where you could actually sleep if you needed to sleep over. There's a, there's a cot, but it's just never very comfortable. Right. It's and the last resort hours. option. Yeah, favorite. ours, for example, it's a uh, it's about a two mile hike, and yeah. Uh, yeah, again, gravity is good when you're trying to get down, but it's still a two mile hike, and if the snow's two feet deep, then the it's snowshoes hard. are yep. a good idea. Now, yeah. Greg Schmink made a, another really good point um, for for folks like when we were talking about snacks and water and stuff. If you happen to be diabetic, having something to help you control your blood sugar. In right. your little kit, couple of pieces of candy or whatever. Yeah, that's uh, it. Yeah. You know, that's uh, that's really critical. I um, do the bag of granola, which uh, you know is also protein in there too for you know keeping you warm yep. if it's a cold part of the yep. world. You know, that we is always that goes with us energy is energy. Yeah. yeah, we have a guy that goes with us who's diabetic, and he uh, occasionally and he carries a big bag of nuts and some stuff with him, and uh, just because mm-hmm. you never know, we're gonna get stuck somewhere. Right. Right. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I know just my laptop bag, there's always a couple of bags of trail mix and right. usually yep. a Snickers bar just because, well, you always need a Snickers. We but, do. Uh, Jerky is real flat, which is nice, too. I, feel, I found out, like, oh, yeah, <laughs> it's like it's real flat, so you can put it in the, the laptop bag. Now, here, here's a good question from Cipriano. Uh, what do you recommend about shoes for mountainous area and uh, and bad terrain? Uh you know, Oof. you need some kind of fairly heavy hiking boot, but you don't want something that weighs so much that it uh, tears your legs apart, too. I well, like uh, I like my Red Wings. Can't argue. There you yeah. go. See, my wife was living in Red Wing when we met, so I'm a fan of those. Yep. Yeah, I think that's, there's a, you know, everybody, you just have to try the boots on and see how you like them. But um, I... I guess I got into these when I was in Vermont, uh, the Neos. I don't know if anybody's seen those, but they're mm-hmm. they're like a big, fat rubber boot with gaiters, kind of. And uh, so you can put almost any kind of shoe, uh, you know, inside of them. Um, and those are really handy. Um, especially around here, we've also got not just ice and snow. we got this thing called muskeg, which you can mm. 
I've nearly lost boots inside there. You're walking along. It looks pretty good. You try to stay away from the puddles. Next thing you know, you're up to your, literally up to the mid thigh. And like, what? What just happened here? Yep. yep. Uh, and, 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 and it, it looks like regular grass. It does look like regular grass. But yeah. the neos are pretty good. Um, I've been back and forth about, uh, you know, not steel toe, but they have now the reinforced toe boots. And it, it really, I don't like those unless I know I'm going to be moving heavy stuff and transmitting that kind of thing. So, yeah, I'm with you on those. Uh, yeah. I mean, and, I've got a pair with the uh, carbon fiber toe reinforcement. Right, right. They weigh exactly. half as much. They do. Typically, but... I'm not picking up something that weighs more than 200 pounds at my age anyway anymore. Exactly. Yeah. Right, but you never know when you're out hiking when uh, you you know the boulder comes down or you know you, you slip and you, you you nail that foot right in there. Oh the yeah. Awesome toe is going to save you a lot of profanity. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The other thing I would say, and I I don't know, I'm sure a lot of people have this experience, but uh, <clears throat> I learned this from an old um, an old uh, farmer and a sugar baker in uh, Vermont, uh, Henry. He's a uh, I guess he's probably pushing 90 now, but um, he turned me on to those uh, uh, micro spikes, cotton micro spikes. Right. They're like a, they're like a, you know, those rubber ice things you put over, but they're they're mm-hmm. kind of halfway between just the uh, anti-slip stuff and uh, and the uh, crampons. They got a nice maybe three-quarter inch uh, spikes that go around. They're chained together, and then there's a big red boot. And those go over almost any boot that I have. And those have saved my butt a lot of times because sometimes you'll be coming down a trail and it's just it's just pure ice. I mean, there's just no way around it. And uh, if you're careful, those things will, will get you down. Those and a couple of hiking poles. I'm not, I'm at the age now where I'm not at all embarrassed to take a couple of carbon fiber you know, hiking poles with me, no matter where I go, just because, especially if you got a pack on your back or you got something going on heavy it just gives you that extra bit of uh, comfort and i'll take those up with me on the helicopter they fold down they're pretty small mm-hmm. so yeah and jake beck yeah. told over in north dakota made a good point that uh in addition to your dry socks it's good to have an extra pair of shoes especially in mud season yes yeah. absolutely and, and that would go back to the muskeg too because uh yeah there's oh, yeah. Nothing, nothing worse than cold wet shoes right yeah had cold nothing worse feet. than cold wet shoes that you've lost at the bottom of a hole that you just can't get out. <laughs> right. Yeah. And depending yeah. on where you are, too, I mean, traction is a thing, too. Uh, uh, the south just as much as the north, I've been told down there. Um, you know, they come up here and they see sand sitting in the sandbag sitting in the back of my truck. What's that for? Well, extra weight and traction if I do get stuck. Mm-hmm. You know, so for those who have the, the vehicle mm-hmm. option of getting to their sites. You know, I guess that's a thing down there, too. When you get into the muck, you know, you could throw that sandbag right under your tire and get you out, too, if you had to. Yep. Yep. Um, Some of that uh, wet clay is just as slippery as ice in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, uh, mudslide season is coming around the bend, too. So now, but, I uh, did have to throw a picture of uh, Alex cleaning out his garage. <laughs> <laughs> that's only half that's of it, dude. Seriously. Yeah. <laughs> it took two trucks, two trips, yeah. But uh, but it, it's a valid point uh, because we get talking about this and it, it goes back to Don Eastman's point earlier about uh, how you pack the van so you can easily load stuff in and load out. Um, you know, at what point do you decide you really don't need the kitchen sink? Right. That That's a very hard line to find. It is. Um, it's really, really hard. Especially if it's going to a site you've never been to or you're picking up the slack for a guy who's on vacation and you don't know what you're going into. You know, some of us have the luxury. Those sites are only an hour away or half hour away. Civilization isn't too far away. Um, A lot of times they're not. You know, you can't run back to the shop and grab your ladder. You can't run back and grab, oh, I need my, I forgot my hammer drill because we're doing something like this, you know, or those types of things you just don't have that luxury so in certain places you know first time out yeah my truck is packed pretty full i'll even bring my four inch strap with me with the brazing kit you know because you never know what you're going to find um, right. in certain instances but I, I guess it's all situational for me i mean my uh, my rf kit as i call it uh, is in a pelican case uh, it's got my spectrum analyzer, my oscilloscope, uh, my power aim in it, you know, with the, the tablet that runs them all. Uh, and the memory card and every RF adapter you can possibly think of is in that Pelican case. Yeah, that well, takes up a fair amount of size. Basically, a dedicated test equipment case. Yeah. 
So, because you, you oh. don't know what you're in for. You know, you, you grab a handful of PC power cords because I've run into that where it's like, oh, look, rodents chewed through the power cord, mm-hmm. you know, uh, or, you know, the, the you bring 10 feet of strap because, you know, oh, look, ARC took out the strap in the ATU um, right. or, or the grounding is bad or something like that. You know, the, the little the number eight wire on a spool that'll come with mm-hmm. you. You know, yep. just to, to the all the, you know, you're going to run into this kind of crap, but you try to gather that information ahead of time. What are you in for? You need to do that recon before you go to the site. You and in a lot of cases, sometimes, it. like for an install, a, a pre-site visit is useful. Absolutely. Um, I will always recommend that and, and almost require it in every instance. Yeah. Yep. Now, and, and uh, Brian made a good point. He doesn't know how many uh, sawzalls they've got in a drawer because they've gotten to the site, needed one, and didn't have it. That's true. Right. Yeah. There, there is a favorite uh, store for every guy out there. For twenty bucks, you can get a sawzall, circular saw, whatever. They've got it. <laughs> um, yep. You know, a pack of drill bits costs you twenty bucks, and usually you can slide that right into the expense report. No one will, no one will bother you. Um, yep. But, you know, when you need a good set of tools, you know, you kind of get the eye from the manager. Why did you spend 600 bucks on at the Makita store? Yeah. You know. uh, getting back to boots really quick. I uh, got two comments in there. Uh, Tony Dimsdale mentioned he liked the Skechers composite toed boots mm-hmm. um, because the slip on boots tend to slip off just as easily sometimes. Right. right. And uh, Matt Golston mentioned uh, high tech boots. Uh, for something that's uh, reasonably priced, EH rated with a composite toe and non-slip. Yep, that's uh, the Red Wings are the same way. They're hiking boots that are EH rated right. with a composite toe. So they're my factory boots when I uh, go to the factory. They're just the same as I'm on a transmitter site versus t- taking the dog for a walk. Yeah. Yep. Matt also mentioned that uh, sand mats are good for traction on snow, ice, and sand. Mm-hmm. So that, that was oh. something I had of so google that might be something to hit google on too sure yeah it'd be nice if we could compile a list of people throw comments up with those things that'd be great oh the, no the, trust me i'm collecting material for the next waves newsletter already okay like yeah, I said, yeah. The, the best thing that a transmitter guy who works on ams can possibly have in his truck is a pair of jumper cables <laughs> yeah, not even you're, you're not right. even arguing that one uh, 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 uh antenna short and stick if you need one bypass an atu or phaser at, at am levels the jumper cables will pass audio they don't care yeah you yeah. Know? and well, i've done that in phaser fires where i just needed to get the station back on the air and work on the phaser well guess what i got in the truck i got jumper cables just the same you know in, in certain parts of the world you don't shut your truck off in the winter period right yeah. right you right. know whether it be a diesel or a gas you know you, sometimes the battery just ain't gonna start so yeah. you need that to get home that night too. Yeah. Now, yeah. one other thing, and this is more of a, I, I, I'm the guy that says, if I hear the phrase, these troubling times one more time, I'm going to uh, go <laughs> yeah, ballistic. Yeah. But uh, Rich, when we were uh, talking yesterday briefly, you had uh, mentioned that you've got a, a few sites that are getting to be more of a challenge to get into because of the uh, health restrictions these days. Well, with, I mean, it's, county it's, it's always, it's always been challenging. We have a site that I can see from my office. It's on top of the federal building. So that right there will tell you everything you need to know. <laughs> um, they used to give us a pass. And then after um, many, many years of finally working through the, the security systems, they decided they weren't going to give contractors passes, which means now every time I go up there, I've got to take all my tools through the x-ray. I used to just be able to go in with a card. Now I can take all the tools through the x-ray, pack them back up, go up the elevator, then I got to go knock on the door, I got to get a key, then I got to walk up two flights of stairs to the transfer shack. And um, that in itself is always challenging. Now it's even more challenging. So I need to, you know, make sure I give them my uh, my new um, DHS FEMA paperwork and show them that I need to be up there. I mean, most of the guys there, you know, they're private security guards. They're not, I mean, I guess they're federal employees, but they're not, you know, They're contracted just the same. They're contractor, yeah. And most of them I know, and they know me, and I have some of their cell phone numbers. Um, but they still got to go through all the all the hoops, and uh, so it makes it makes it a little more challenging. But that, that brings up a really good point of n- not only you know you have to know your technical, but you have to be 
a human being too you just, to know in these you know times right now where people are a little skittish when you're walking up to a security booth i'm in i'm on the outskirts of minneapolis trust yeah. me walking up to a guy at a, behind a security booth makes you jittery real quick around here <laughs> uh but you know make sure that you're like hey i'm a human being too this is what i'm doing for my job and the security right. guard's doing the same thing for you He's right. just there to do his job. So you, you you get to know these guys and treat them like human beings. They're just there doing their job the same as you. But yep. know them so they know why you're there. When they see it, say, right. hey, Rich, what are you doing? Hey, I got to go back up to the roof. We got another problem. He's like, all right, right. here, sign the log yep. book. Yep. You know, he's just doing his job. Don't give him a hard time any more than he's going to give you one. Right. right. Uh, exactly. Back to multi tools real quick. Uh, Jesse had asked if uh, anybody had uh, had seen the Kershaw Select Fire yet. No, uh, can't say that I have. Got a good blade with a fold out bit driver and onboard storage. Oh my gosh! So nice. uh, just uh, j drop a note about that, and uh, I know I'll be doing some Google. And like I say, I'm yeah. collecting material for the next Waves newsletter off uh, off of mm -hmm. these sessions. So I think That's we'll. Great. Uh, We'll we'll spread some of the info around too. So thanks for that, Jesse. Um, oh, Marcus, Marco, come back with a good one. There's another good idea. Uh, one of those little jump starter battery packs for your vehicle that'll sit in the right. just sit in the console. Yep. Yeah. I've got one of those too. Too, right? Yep. They usually do, but always the the thing about those though is that they're so small and out of the way that people do forget about them. I use them to oh, power. Them. Um, they, they let them drain. I use it right. actually uh, for anybody who's familiar with like the power aim or any of the VNAs, the USB VNAs, because uh, I do a little bit of AM work. I use those as the battery pack for those as well because oh, they're nice. powered. Sure. Of course. Yeah, and yeah. with a tw with a 20,000 milliamp hour battery attached to it, the thing will sit there all day long and night long. And I do too, 16 hours later. And then you go to jump your truck at you know 40 below, it ain't got enough juice left. Yeah, so yeah. you have to know your tools in, right. in, in what is it capable of and what is what you know you, you don't want to carry two of them lithium ion batteries aren't as light as people think they are no they're not but that's and, and the again they're not a jumper cable to help you on the am they are a very i try to find multitask tools not single yeah, use yeah. tools yeah the only single use tool i have is a fire extinguisher mm -hmm. yeah yeah. Well, and the other challenge too, I mean, the uh, the lithium cells, it's not something like in, in Rich's case, you can't take it in check baggage. Right. No, you can't. So, so that, uh, you know, if you do sites that require airplane travel to get to, and when a, somebody had made another good comment, if you do any amount of international travel, having an assortment of AC adapters as well as oh, yeah. RF adapters. Right. Making sure your product, your pro, anything you bring with you internationally can handle the power of where you're going. Check your power right. supplies. Yeah, I did right. that once. I went to I went to IBC a couple of years ago and I plugged in, I grabbed my uh, powered antenna. I looked at it. Oh, look, 110 only. Well, that was yeah. useless. Right. So, so. You know, there are a bunch of things there. Now, we did uh, talk quite a bit about safety. Um, Alex had mentioned that uh, <laughs> uh, John Van Milligan says a fire extinguisher is a multi-use tool because you can throw it at things. That's uh, true. <laughs> at bears. You can, you can throw it, at it. it goes hand in hand with the air horn. And, yeah, and that I fit like right it. into uh, <laughs> fit right into this slide. Now, you might recall, I don't know the the folks that were on last week's webinar talking about uh, about site prep and uh, and uh, things like that. Uh, Jason Gordetzer had mentioned that he he doesn't go on site in the winter anymore without a hard hat. And, oh, that's uh, a good point. Really good point. Yeah. Yep. You know, and I mean, even if you've got a short tower, you know, with a little bit of ice on it, that little bit of ice starts shedding. It uh, it can uh, cause some damage. Ice from 20 yeah. feet still hits you just as hard as ice from 200 feet. Yeah. It hurts. <laughs> it hurts. Yeah. 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 I don't. I don't have a hard hat that I carry because I, I find that the bulky, you know, the the lip. So what I use is a, I have a ski helmet, which I think is just as good, you know, or mm -hmm. snowboarding helmet. Um, mm -hmm. Sure. It doesn't have that lip on it, but yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, ropes. People don't talk about ropes. Um, yep. Good Even climbing if it's just rope. a paracord and a little bit of climbing rope. I mean, you may not necessarily always need a climbing rope, but uh, certainly paracord and things will get you through a lot of lot of stuff. 
Yep. Uh, yeah. No. I, I call my tower crew and I ask them what kind of cor- uh, what, what kind of uh, rope they use. And I go and buy a hundred feet of that. And that's in my yeah. toolkit just the same, because if it can pull my antenna up, it can pull pretty much anything else I'm going to deal with out of it. Right. Exactly. exactly. And I mean, the best part about that is it can replace a lot of other things. Like you notice in my toolkit, I had a, a three ton toe strap in there. Yeah, exactly. Now, so what you're looking at here is the, and I probably don't necessarily shouldn't be showing you what I uh, what I live on, which may or may not be why I uh, gained weight so fast after I quit smoking. But uh, but you're looking at the inventory list for my deep freeze. So uh, what do you do for inventory on the stuff that you have it for your various sites? And uh, Rich, this would be a good one for you because you have got multiple sites. I do, and I I, I as I said earlier, I. I'm not a good list making person, although I do it on the for the equipment. Um, what I have is pictures of everything, and I use those pictures um, when I get ready to go to a site. I go, no, don't need to throw the soldering iron in. I don't need this. Uh, mm-hmm. They've got a socket set there. I've got this, um, and that probably could get more formalized as as a list that I could add to uh, a smart sheet or something like that. Because but that's uh, that's cool because something like that you could take the picture and again like looking at Evernote or smart sheets you could incorporate the picture directly into the. Oh, uh, uh, that's a good point. Document. Yeah, yeah. So so no, that's it, a really good idea. And a, and a yeah. question there, Rich, is too for you specifically. I mean, are you doing like uh, I, let let's use EMF for instance, who goes around to their sites whether the site needs a visit or not. Or are you playing fireman all the time? Are you going there because there's a problem? Or are you going just for checkup? Uh, both. You know, okay. we have a regular schedule that we go to. But, you know, there's a small stations and they don't have a staff engineer. And so, you know, it always ends up being like, oh, well, while you're here, we got this problem, that problem. And we also, I mean, you know, thank goodness for the IT age. There's an mm-hmm. awful lot that I do, and I'm sure you do too, and Jeff, uh, that I can do uh, remotely with people. So I don't have to fly down. Um, mm-hmm. You know, uh, this business with uh, Facebook, uh, Zoom, and those kind of things, when people have it on their phone, it's just so great to say, well, go into the control room and take a look. Let me show you, show me what's going on in the console, and we'll try this, this, and this. And, you know, if at the end of the day I have to fly down, I can, but I would say probably 90% of the time I can walk them through stuff uh, that we could both see, and then they learn something. Yeah. Um, I don't really have any... Uh, um, worries about working myself out of a job i'd rather empower people to know that they can take care of stuff as much as they can and i'll help them you know with the rest so so yeah i I think that might answer your question oh and there's uh there's a must-have toolkit list that i surprised none of us mentioned it yet uh duct tape oh yeah so thanks rich kunkel for that one because uh yeah yeah, absolutely all right well guys we're we're running close to the top of the hour um, okay. I do want to, if anybody's got any other questions or comments, uh, uh, I mean, by all means, raise your hand now. I uh, took out the, I've got a picture of Alex that's a little less uh, impressive, but uh, he wouldn't, uh, <laughs> I guess he, he'd let me do it. But, you I know, guess, um, right. so I've uh, definitely been storing all of the, uh, all, all of the comments and questions in the, uh, in the questions box. Uh, I'm really glad that we did get so much input from that. Uh, thanks for that. Yeah, that's thank great. You very much. Yeah, 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 terrific. And on that point, folks, thank you very much for attending another Transmission Talk Tuesday. I can never remember. I want to call it Tech Talk Tuesday, but a uh, bunch of guys sitting around talking about transmitter stuff. Yeah. And uh, thank you very Better much. Better than <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and we hope to see you all next week. Thanks, all. Stay safe. Wash your hands. (laughs) (laughs) Bye now. Bye-bye.